Epsilon 9 is an uncharted Amiga gem. Get ready for a deep dive and retrospective, plus Amiga's scene news and updates. It's Amigos, everything Amiga. Hi everybody, welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today, Aaron, we're talking about Epsilon 9. Mm. You know, the, the aliens in Epsilon 9 are called Stingons. Yeah. This kind of reminds me of the old uh, He-Man naming convention for the bad guys. Yeah. Like, we've got one guy, he looks like a skunk. We're going to name him Stinkor. Well... I think they may have been uh, slightly uh, ripping off Star Trek, their boat. You think so? Yeah, because I, I read an interview with the guy. That's oh. exactly what they did. Come on, did you, did you actually think that was an original name? I thought it was. I thought they were going to sting you. You didn't think it was like Klingons at all? It never occurred to it you? It never occurred to me. These things often pass me by. <laughs> Good Lord. What's the worst Star Trek ripoff you've ever seen? Have you ever seen any of those like homemade... Star Trek movies. I've watched a bunch of the homemade, like the uh, non-official right. Star Treks. Right. I, actually, they're, I'm always impressed that the, that they're. I mean, they're great efforts. They're not always the best. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very good. You know, if I'm honest, Star Wars and Star Trek both of them are like uh, some pretty talented fans. You know that that uh, and I like a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff I watch of that ilk is based in the uh, original Star Trek universe. So they've it's easier to copy. I think a lot of that stuff so they've got. I mean, the, they've got the whole set, and they even have some. I watched one that had actual stars for the original show on the show. What do you have to have? Because obviously, you're you're a big Doctor Who guy, and the, Doctor Who, not, I was not exactly, especially the early Doctor Who's, not exactly world renowned for their world class special effects. So obviously, special effects not necessary. What's your bar? What do you need to have for a good sci fi series? Well, but I'm going to stand up for Doctor Who before I say anything because I, they get that a lot, and sometimes the original Star Trek gets it too. What do you want? The show debuted in like the 60s. There was no... Who else was doing science fiction? Nobody. That's who. You ever watch old Flash Gordon? They're all the crap. They're the best they can. You know, and, and the thing is, Doctor Who was going in places that no show was going. None. They were doing a combination of, 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 of sci-fi and period piece stuff. So you can't just whip together. We need, a, we need a, a, a slime monster to go down in our Roman set... You know, that's a lot to ask of a special effects department for a TV, basically a TV show. So well, they're, I think they did a good job. Okay. All things considered. What do you need for a good science fiction show? It all comes down to two things to me. Writing and uh, writing good plots of the show and good people to deliver that uh, the uh, dialogue and stuff. So one of the, I was watching the original Star Trek last night. I was talking to my buddy at work about it, right? It's the old... They visit the the uh, planet that's based on Rome episode. You ever seen that no, one? No, I don't think so. And 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 it was a the premise behind it was what would happen if Rome had never fallen. Okay, interesting. And, and it grew up into basically mod at the time of modern nineteen sixties mm -hmm. America, and which was great. But I mean, it was also there's dopiness to it. Mm -hmm. But the good thing about science fiction, if it's interesting, you can you can give away a little bit of the goofiness. For example, all the Romans were like. White motorcycle helmets. Mm. Like, I don't know why the yeah. guards did, and they had machine guns. They wore these weird like trench coats. I don't know why. You can, that's the stuff you can get by. You right. can't like, for example, the, there's a cutting. There's a point where you can't accept that, and then you go into the realm of like Roger Corman or Ed Wood or some of these more hacky guys that just had dopey special effects and goofy costumes what, and crappy dialogue. What do you think is the dopiest sci-fi series? Sci-fi series. Yeah, like that aired on TV. Oh, gosh, do you Earth have one? Two? I never saw Earth 2, so I can't comment on that. I don't know. I mean, sci-fi covers a lot of ground, If I'm to be honest with you. Uh, Manimal was awful goofy. Was that, I mean, was that set in space? No, but, you didn't, but it was, it was a, you know, science I guess I'm me. thinking like something like set in space. But what do you think? Have you got one that comes to mind? No, or? I like them all. You can't think of any one. You're the ask the question. You can't think of one dopey one. I, well, people always talk about Earth too. People always talk about uh, space 1999. I mean, if if you want uh, of the dopiest, why? What about Barbarella? Ones? Was that a TV show? That was show? a movie. Oh. Lost in Space was goofy, mm -hmm. real goofy. Was it campy though? Oh yeah. There's an episode where they fight. They take on a, a they find a planet full of giant walking, talking vegetables. 
That's, that sounds pretty good. Right? Stuff like that. I mean, trust me, this is the Zeus of, 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 of science fiction. You like Zeus, the horrible wrestler. Yes. This is like, if he was going to sit down and watch the, his wrestling equivalent, it'd be lost in space. And the funny thing is, despite how stupid that show is, I mean, it was stupid. Everybody knew it. Uh, Will Robinson was great. Bill Mooney, who was uh, is great, still around, still does great stuff. You know, uh, you had the Dr. Smith, who was great. And so you, you still had amusing characters, but they were like little islands in this show of stupidity. The rest of the characters almost weren't even there. It was already three guys. Will Robinson, Dr. Smith, and the robot. That was the only thing you cared about. No one else was worth a crap on that show. And that predated, that was, was Land of the Lost, or Land of the Lost, was, uh, was Lost in Space, was that 50s? No, no, no. It was it was out in the in the sixties and okay. seventies. Yeah, like, okay. or, I don't know if it made it to the seventies, but it was sixties. You know, but there are plenty of goofy science fiction shows. You know, from back in the day. Someone just mentioned Land of the Giants is goofy. Another one is a Time Tunnel is another goofy mm. one. Uh, Tomorrow People, which was more modern, but was kind of I kind of liked it, but it was kind of goofy. I think it was. British or Australian. And I think you've made your thoughts known on Farscape before. Well, I mean, I don't think Farscape's a bad show. I just didn't get into it. You, know? you didn't like the puppets. I like, the thing is I love Muppets, but mm-hmm. I, just, I just didn't do it for me. But mm-hmm. some people love it. Hey, what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, we've set the table, Aaron. Let's talk about Epsilon 9. I made it huge. Did you like that? I loved that how nice? you made it huge. <laughs> All right, out of context. So this week, this is a real, uh, i never heard of this one. I know you haven't heard of no. it. No. Epsilon 9, The Revenge of the Stingons. Uh, this is, of course, public domainy or mm. domination, whichever one you prefer. And this is uh, really, and in some ways, this is one of the uh, upper tier oh, public surely. domain games we've looked at. So... Uh, released in '95, so this is a late in the game. Uh, two discs, and they've got the publisher that's listed as Licenseware, and basically Licenseware just I guess we're like a distributor. They had tons of PD offerings. I looked to see what they had. We hadn't covered anything that I saw. So uh, the developer of this is listed as DTO Software, but it's really it was just a dude, uh, Edmund Clay. DTO Software released some of his titles, including Lethal Formula, Lost Prince. And the pre and basically the game that came before the game we're looking at this week called Starbase 13. This is actually a sequel game. Mm. I don't know if you knew that or not. Um, this guy Edmund Clay is an interesting cat. So he did uh, uh, several games. I mentioned a couple there: Starbase 13, uh, Lost Prince, Lethal Formula, Twins, and Twins Pro and Entity. But the one thing he released that I think merits some discussion is a thing called Grack. Uh, in fact, Grack is actually mentioned in the it game. It plays, yeah, plays a part in the it's game. A, it's, it's the, the password, password, yeah, mm-hmm. for the first computer. So Grack is a, is the graphic adventure creator, and he made this thing. And he actually, and, and apparently, it's a pretty decent. I think it's some kind of thing for Amos that uh, you use to make your own graphic adventures. I uh, uh, I saw some ads for it, uh, and it was pretty interesting. Believe it or not, I was I was nosing around and I found a little bit about uh, the, about DTO software and about uh, the fellow that made it. Uh, so this guy was literally you, you know your patented like bedroom coder. He was just doing this stuff for fun. Uh, he got into Basic. He had a computer. It had Basic on. It. He's like, well, I got a computer with Basic. I guess I'll learn how to program. Bam! That's the way he started. Uh, and uh, he started writing his own stuff. All the games that he did, for the most part, he did all everything in them. He did the music, the graphics, everything. And some of the graphics, these are, I mean, we'll get into that, but they're, it's not like me and you use D paint mm-hmm. and, you know, and want something horrible. Uh, he was really into science fiction, surprise, surprise. And he was uh, into Star Trek a lot too, B5, a lot of that stuff. So clearly the guy had good taste. He had a brother, John. They worked together on some of these. And then John and his buddy also made some other games that were released through different uh, different. Uh, when when was B five? Does this game pre, pre uh, does this game come out before Babylon? This 5? game would come out before yeah before B. I have to think. Gosh, it's been so long since the original B five, but I think this would have predated it. Okay, but they did other stuff after this. You don't think there's any there's any connection like where there's there's nothing like there's nothing in this game that was remotely okay. like B five. Okay. 
What do you think? The beef up ripped this guy? I don't think so. You know, I don't want to say ripped off. Well, uh, yeah, you're nuts. Uh, So, so anyway, a lot of his stuff, some of his stuff uh, was, uh, did, uh, had magazine CDs and stuff. So, you know, that's the, in Germany, I believe, was one place I read where it had been shopped around on there. So, it was a, uh, this guy was uh, what I would call someone who had uh, worked his way up and made his own program to make games and then used it. And there you go. And so the game we're looking at, uh, Epsilon 9, like I said, was a sequel to his pre- one of his previous games. In fact, uh, the lead character in this debuted in Starbase 13 uh, boat. So, uh, do you want to give them a quick synopsis? Yeah. Of the of the mission in this with uh, you know how and the gang. So I think uh, is his name you know how or you know who? You know who? You know who? That's okay. Better. Because that's the joke. Yeah. Well, you know how it works too. But I mean, it's no, it doesn't. Well, you're right. Listen, I mispronounced the name. But I mean, you can make <laughs> a game with you know how, and it would still sort of be funny, just not as funny. You are you know who, okay? And you are tasked. You you get sent off to go take care of this alien invasion on this on this planet, okay? Uh, so you you roll in, and the 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 game actually it launches with you. Uh, you're on a sort of. Um, starship somewhere and you you know goes to the commander and the commander says listen you know you need to go like see what's going on on this planet they've been invaded by aliens and this is your classic you know we're not going to send the whole fleet out to take care of the alien invasion we're yeah. going to send one man on one ship yeah and uh we should uh we should talk a little bit about the opening scene here because it's quite striking. Yeah, what what the heck is that? This looks like uh there's a there's a the Japanese weapon called a tonfa. Are yeah. you familiar I've with got, this? I've got a tonfa. Okay. It don't look like that. Well, it kind of reminds you of it because it's got a handle and it's got a stick coming out like this. Well, so it, it's sort of tonfa s. It reminded me of something I, we can't get into. Is that it reminded me of? If your mind's in the gutter, it might look like something else. Yeah. This this is just a shape floating in a view screen on, yeah. the, on the main ship. It's the only 3D esque rendered thing in the game. I have a feeling that he he late. What what is the technique that you use ray tracing yeah. on the Amiga? He ray traced this random object probably, in his house. Probably the less consideration given to that, the better. <laughs> anyway, you blast off in your ship. The ship taking off and landing sequence is surprisingly well done. And the opening is very is cool, too. Yeah, very, yeah. very opening. Uh, I mean, you know, you can tell that everything was made in this engine. Uh, w- but when you get out, I think it's the only cut scene in the game, really, is the, the whole landing sequence. So anyway, uh, you land on the ship, or you land on the planet... And you you enter into this office, and that's really where the game begins. It's your typical uh, point and click adventure opening, where you're given a task, and then all of the help goes away, and you just you're there clicking on things and clicking on other things. Yeah, uh, you know. Now, let's just talk about first impressions. Listen, the game starts off nicely. It's got a nice little tune. The ship is cool. It's it's obviously you know right away that it's just a funny game. You know, uh, so which is so okay. You know, in the tradition of you mm-hmm. know Monkey Island or whatnot, uh, and then you like you said the landing sequence is cool. The opening scene, it you know right away that whoever made this is not just some jabroni. Mm-hmm. This guy, this game looks nice. It's attractive. Uh, the interface. It took me a little while to figure it out just because I wasn't used to the second button. The one I struggled like an idiot for about a half hour. Trying to figure out why I could get the, the first game, button to the work. The game is weird. Um, you know, I, I read there, this is since it's a PD game, it came with a readme file in the Amiga, but there's no, I couldn't find, uh, actually I think on Lemon there might be, there might be printed out instructions there too, but in this game you, you select things with the left mouse button, but you perform actions with the right mouse button. So for example, you might click on examine with the left button, you click on, uh, you know, door with the left button, but then to make the thing do the thing you want it to do, you click on the right button. And moving him is the left button yeah, as well. Yeah, It's exactly. actually, once you get used to it... It's not bad. It's, I'll kind of, I understood. That was not where I had problems. Mm. Now, um, uh, in the opening scene, we're going to talk about the opening scene just as a, this is a good way to explain exactly how things work in the game, because I think it's pretty, uh, opens it up pretty well. So, come to an office room... And, uh, of course, you're down here to investigate what happened to everybody. 
and it, the office is empty. And so what you're and the door out of the office, the elevator door is locked. And so what you've got to do, and they made this is like the tutorial mm-hmm. area. You've yeah. got to go through this office, uh, examine some stuff that's on the desk, open some stuff, try to figure out how to activate that door by using the computer. Uh, it, I'd say everything in this particular area is fairly logical. It's not super difficult. And, and once you figure out the uh, how the uh, mouse works and the controls work, the uh, interface boat mentioned uh, at the bottom is stuff like use, examine, stuff like that in little boxes. Uh, uh, I thought, I understood how it worked for the most part. I mean, did, how does this mesh out with some of the other interfaces you've seen for this sort of game? This is very reminiscent of like the Scum Engine yeah. at the time. This is like the early Scum Engine where you have text prompts at the bottom that you click on. They've limited the amount of text prompts in this game from a, from saying you know from something like Maniac Mansion. Yeah. Uh, you've got examine, operate, use, take, talk, shoot, and switch. Um, probably a couple too many. Yeah, right? probably a couple too many. Do we need many. to operate and use? Right. Example, probably not. Right. You know. Um, but, uh, and then you've got a massive black space that uh, it, it acts as both sort of your command builder and your inventory. Uh, there's no icons in the inventory. There's no icons in the commands. Everything is text-based, which I assume is one of the features of this Grack engine. It is interesting because, for example... At one point, like, for example, if you want to use your gun, you can hit the button use, and then all the stuff that you can use that you have or that is nearby will appear in the bottom black Mm -hmm. area with use in front of it. You sort of click that. It's it's sort of advanced. Sort. I mean, it's it's something. It's not bad. I found it to be pretty intuitive compared to a lot of the point-and-click interfaces that we've played in these sorts of games. I really feel like, well, first of all, I really feel like Scum is the best interface. So if you're going to model something off off one of these interfaces, don't do King's Quest, do Scum. You yeah. know, don't do Sierra. But I mean, I got to give the guy credit for coming up with something where it's uh, similar to, but not a complete rip off yeah. of. Yeah. So I'll give him credit. Uh, so once you learn how to navigate the menu, and you'll never fully know. <laughs> and by the way, there's a button at the end of it called Switch, which we'll get to here in a minute because. After you complete the very first room, a dude shows up firing. Turns out he's uh, one of the workers there. And uh, eventually you are, and him team up. Mm-hmm. Because right as you figure out how to open the, how to open that door, uh, the Stingons land. I believe it was three scout ships with 50 men each, mm-hmm. I believe is what he says. And so they get into the uh, elevator and go down. Now... This opening room, I was made. I didn't use any cheats or uh, solutions, and there are solutions floating around for this. Uh, I actually managed to get through it on my own. All right, I was proud of myself. Actually, good work. And then the wheels came off shortly thereafter <laughs> because this game turns up to eleven pretty much right away after this. I think in this room. Well, uh, when you move into the game, it, it gets more like a traditional game. It gets harder. Yeah, th- this is a game. Where uh, you know you you realize pretty pretty immediately that you're going to have to operate. It's it, it gives you there are many things going on at once. You've got your traditional point and click adventure style puzzles, but then you also have another element. And the other element is that you you have to maneuver two different guys, and there are these these are a lot of times location based puzzles too. Yeah. So. Uh, after you leave the main room, you descend the elevator down to the depths of the basement because they figure the Stingons can't find us there. Yeah, they get to okay. the lowest level. And this is where the game ended for me. Oh, really? Uh, my play as far through. as you could go? I got to the bottom and I could not figure out. I clicked on what I thought was every single thing in the room with everything else. After I went back and I watched the playthrough, I realized that I, I must have just left one out. Because there's the way these puzzles work, and this is like every adventure game, if you miss one thing, you're never going to figure it out. Yeah. Okay? But, like many adventure games, once you see the solution, it's like incredibly easy. You're like, oh my gosh, I feel well, like an idiot. I wouldn't say that. So, they, these guys get to... Now, you got out of the lift, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, when you get down to the... And there's there's some dialogue that happens in the, in the lift. And eventually, you get down to this area. And this is your first kind of a more hardcore puzzle. Now, I will say... I did get past this part, this next part, with one little tip. 
And the tip is, and this is where I learned about the switch. I, at this point, when I played this, I, I didn't know you could switch to the other guy. Mm-hmm. So I did see someone switch guys. I'm like, okay, that explains that. So you, the first puzzle you come to, you're in this room, in this cavern, and there's a door, and on the other side of the door is something aliens put there. It's a lock. Mm-hmm. And so you've got to figure out how to get this door open. Now, one thing I learned from just doing research, I didn't even know this, too. Maybe it was, they may have mentioned Maybe I didn't notice it. You can tell me because you're good at that. The guy you play is a, is an android. He's not a real guy. Oh, okay? did you know that? I must have missed that. Well, it was in the first game. Okay. Okay. So, uh, there's a room where the goal of this room is to get through the alien door, and there are three tanks there. There's oxygen, uh, nitrogen, and uh, uh, chlorine. Chlorine. That's right. So what you've got to do is you've got to turn the knobs on these. You've got a little like a tricorder thing. And you can tell the atmosphere on the other side of the door, and you can tell the atmosphere in your yeah, room. Yeah, that was the thing I didn't realize that you had to, because it's like, what would possess you to think that you could analyze another room that you're not in with your tricorder? Right. I, I didn't put that together. Right. Well, uh, I tried everything else, and then I was like, hey, I wonder if I could do this. Mm-hmm. And But I still, at this point, didn't know about getting... So anyway, before you can fool the tanks, you've got to get your other guy back into the lift, or because he can't, he can't breathe chlorine. He can't breathe chlorine. And then you get now here's the part that took me forever. It's fiddling with the tanks. And every time you fiddle with the tanks, you've got to use your tricorder to determine what the atmosphere of the room is. Because you know what it is in the other room. Mm-hmm. All right. It took me eight million years to do this. And even when I did it, I don't know what I did. I was I would tweak all the three different things and ev- and it, you could read, you're like five percent off. But I could never make it work. And so I finally, I finally got. It. I mean, I kid you not when I sat here for an hour and I cussed a blue streak at this game. I was so upset. This would have made me quit playing immediately if we weren't going to show on it. But again, there's probably a trick to it that I'm too dumb to understand. And then once you even out the uh, the atmosphere, as the door opens, you can go in. Mm-hmm. That is not the hardest puzzle in the game no. by a long shot. Uh, and, and, and so the game now, uh, I've read some different player reviews that said they got they beat this game and they enjoyed it and I have no doubt that someone who's particularly skilled in this sort of game could go through it. Uh, however, much like many other games, I am not particularly skilled and so pretty much I didn't get much further than this area and then I had to go back and just watch the rest well, of it. Well, in the, in the next room the game the character of the game changes. Because in adventure games, you're using it's usually inventory puzzles. Sometimes yeah. it's location puzzles. You got to be in the right place at the right time. But in this room, you have a set of twelve logic puzzles oh, to solve. Man, yeah. and if there's anything that makes me feel like I want to just leave this mortal coil, it's let's solve some logic puzzles. Yeah, that's no good. Uh, and you have to do it, and you have to solve 12 of them, and you have to do them in the right order to make this path appear going on uh, to, so you can cross this bridge. And what makes it even worse is you can fail three times, and then you die, and then you have to start over. Yeah. Now, uh, thankfully, you could save your game right. with the F- F1 to F10. But here's the thing. this Amongst the people that have played this game, apparently this the, the bridge room is legendarily difficult. All right, and so considering the rest of the game is really hard, I, I, this is like but, ultra yeah, hard. Yeah, but I mean, I can forgive like difficult adventure game style puzzles because that's what you've signed up for ostensibly yeah. here. But this is just a totally different style of puzzle and it's not welcome and he shouldn't have put it in here. It makes his game less fun. Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. When I was full with the gas tanks, I was thinking to myself, who enjoys this? Right. And that's, I mean, and it's okay. What do you, sh- I mean, and again, you should have just been able to match it up, maybe typing things on your on your keyboard or whatever, like the way that you just described it. Like, why did he make it so needlessly difficult? The, the, uh, maybe uh, maybe it's just hard to us. I, I can never know. I never know for sure, but you're a pretty good hand at this sort of thing. With all that said, I've got to give the guy props because we're reviewing this game like it's a real paid for game. Right, right. Because the quality of this, puzzle difficulty aside, and I, and I told Boat when he did his intro, I looked at him kind of cross-eyed, but he's not wrong. This is sort of a hidden gem for for these sort of people that like these sorts of you know, point-and-click type games, the questing games. 
Because this thing could have easily, they could have sold this, if it was longer, they could have sold this anywhere, and it would have been fine. This looks as good as a lot of the ones we've played. The dialogue in it's amusing. You know, I watched a complete playthrough of it. It was amusing. It was, uh, it, uh, it's self-aware. You're not even sure if you're the good guy uh, in through parts of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm it, not sure if the sting odds are that bad. And, right? here, and here's the other thing. This game is not long. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't have a problem with that. I mean, first of all, because it's a PD game. Yeah. So, you know, you're not paying for it. You don't yeah. feel like you've lost out. Oh, yeah. But, you know, this is the sort of thing, this episodic adventure, you know, because like you said, this is a sequel. This is exactly the kind of thing that Telltale brought back to the market 20 years after this with their Monkey Island series, with the uh, with the, 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 the Homestar Runner series. They have these episodic point and click adventures where you just play little chunks of the story and then, you, you know, it takes you a couple hours and then the next month another one comes out. I think that's super cool because a little of this genre for me goes a long way. And a lot of these games like Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. I mean, you're talking about a four or five hour gauntlet that you're running through. And I mean, it's just hard for me at this stage in my life to commit to that kind of time. But if you said, listen, we're gonna release these little point and click adventures that might take you an hour or two to get through. We're gonna do it once every couple months, once every six months, you know, would you be down for that? Yeah, absolutely. Now, the downside with this game is though, is like the logic puzzles. That's like nine tenths of the battle, you know, like then you have this whole other game that you've got to get through. At this point, I would have never seen the rest of this because I would have never got past the logic puzzles. Well, the game, I mean, I watched a playthrough, a complete playthrough that the fellow went through and it was about, uh, what, 19 minutes, yeah. something like that. You would never go through it that quickly. No, never. no, never. And uh, so, I mean, I don't know how much gameplay you would derive from mine. But for me, it may last me forever, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I looked at some of the puzzles are much more traditional. You probably could figure it out puzzles. Some are not. Mm -hmm. There were no egregious. Uh, I mean, there were some, the logic puzzles, you're going to have to learn how to do them. Right. But there, I didn't see anything ultra egregious where it was a complete ripoff. Yeah. All right. So there's. And people have beaten this, so clearly there's a path forward. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me. I'm going to give this guy major props here because it is astounding to me that one guy did this game. This Edmund Clay, he was talented programmer. He was talented at doing graphics. He was talented at the tunes that are in it are fine. And the dialogue is good. Mm -hmm. If you watch this, it's not like, because, I mean, you know what it's like when you see someone do che some cheesy comedy. Oh, yeah. Listen, I'm the cheesiest, so I know cheesy comedy. This is good stuff. I mean, it's 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 tongue-in-cheek, but it's interesting, and it's well-written, and it uh, it makes you want to see what happened. Mm -hmm. So, to that guy's credit, you got to give him all the credit in the world for putting this thing together. Uh, and whatever system he has set up to make these games... Clearly, he could produce a darn good game with it. I don't think this thing would be out of place in any collection or on any uh, actual media for To sale. me, I mean, of course, this came out in 1995. Yeah. So it's not as if, like, there were still Amiga magazines around. I don't know what kind of oh, circulation yeah. things we're dealing with. But this seems like a game that if I was a publisher, I'd contact this guy and say, listen, we're going to give you some bucks. Let's put this on, on the cover disc. Because yeah. this is a game... It was. It yeah. was on some cover disc. So... They absolutely must I, the, have got hold of it. There is really, I mean, the way that people talk in this game is a little bit weird. They do kind of a Muppety thing where yeah. the top of their head kind of flips back like a flip top head. Yeah. Um, but apart from that, the graphics are stunning. Like you said, the dialogue's really good. Uh, and the graphics don't look amateur. No, that's not the, at that's all. That's the stunning. I mean, you when you, if you've played a lot of these games, you know what they should look like. Mm -hmm. This looks like it. Yeah. The floors are reflective. They're shallowing. Yeah. There's all the stuff you need to get. The movement's good. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, hats off to the guy. Now, I, I like I said, I found an interview with the guy. and did a little research on him. And it turns out, at least as of 2005, he was a program, games programmer in the industry somewhere. Okay. okay. Now, he said it wasn't doing adventure games, which is a tragedy. So he may just be one of the many... Uh, uh, faceless programmers, who knows? Mm -hmm. And I didn't see any direct credits associated with him with like Moby or anything, but it's good to know that it at least went into the field. Right. You know, at least as of 2005. So there you go. So overall, if you think about the graphics, the music, the interface he came up with, 
I called it a winner. I would like to know you don't have in it, and I'm, I'm not. You don't have on your notes if uh, any other famous games that were built in this engine or any other games that were built with the graphic adventure. Creator, uh, do you? I know that his brother's games, a couple of them were built okay. with it, and, but I don't. I don't know of any others. Now he had some. For example, he had I believe Lethal Formula <clears throat> was built as the sort of the demo game for Grack, mm -hmm. and I believe it came with it. It was it was people so. He built his own games in it and distributed them, and then sold the system as well. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how well it sold. It's available uh, on his website, which is still up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know he had, as of around two thousand, he had started to dip his toe in the pool of DOS. Mm -hmm. But I don't think anything ever came of it. So this is one of those guys that you know he came, he did his thing, and he was out. And so that's just the way it is. Um, there were not a lot of reviews on this, but I did. Lemon did score it both uh, with a seven point eight three. I think if you look at the everything involved in the game, I think that's a fairly. I mean, that's a really a glowing review for a PD game of this sort. Uh, and really, if it was longer and more, I mean, because you're what we're talking about here is like this would have been maybe a, a seventh or an eighth of a, of a game like of a Monkey Island yeah. or, or Fly the Amazon Queen. You know, so you would have many, but I mean, of course, one guy, you know, so if, if you play the sequel for the, or the prequel for this and did play this, maybe you're getting sort of maybe a fourth of a huge game. Right. So maybe that would tide you over. Mm -hmm. Do we get any action on Discord? We got no action on Discord. You know, PD is a tough thing sometimes. This with was the, not with the easy to reviews. find. Yeah. We had to get our good buddy, I think it was Pixels of Dawn, mm -hmm. who set yeah, us up. He with set the us desk. up. Thank you, Pix. We appreciate that. I will say there's no WHD load for this. Uh, however, I, I, I fired us up on the Mini Amigo, my mister, and uh, just all you have to do is just uh, put the ADFs in there, double click on the uh, file, and you're off and running. Mm -hmm. So, it was not difficult. There was no install or any weirdness. It, it ran without any problem. Yeah, yeah I didn't have any so trouble wanna, running it at all. If you want to give this a shot, go look it up. I think you'd be uh, in for something fun there. Buddy. Absolutely. Are you a sketchy tech? Do you have the right tools for the job? Have there been incidents? Next time, don't try to fix it yourself. Send your broken Amiga to Retro Rewind. Get a full diagnostic, a reasonable estimate, and the peace of mind knowing that your machine is in the hands of real technicians with decades of experience and cutting edge repair equipment. Save 10% off your repair with the promo code AMIGOS10. Thank you to RetroRewind.ca for supporting this episode. All right, we're back with some Amiga news, Boat Sturge. All right, our first link, Aaron, this is not uh, directly Amiga related. It's more Amiga adjacent, but I, okay. wanted to, uh, I wanted to bring it to people's attention because this guy is such a huge name in the Amiga scene. This is uh, an interview on Game Boy uh, Studio Central, all things Game Boy Studio. So oh. this is people that uh, create things with the Game Boy, uh, and they actually have an interview with Alistair Brimble. Of course, Alistair Brimble, a huge force to be reckoned with, uh, composer of the uh, Super Frog music Your as well favorite. as many other games. You know, Super Frog, not my favorite game, but man, it's got some great music. Yeah, it does. Uh, and, uh, but he talks about his whole career. He did a lot of stuff for uh, Codemasters for the NES. Uh, he And then, of course, he did tons and tons and tons of of Game Boy music as well. So I had no um, idea that he did a ton of Game Boy music. Yeah, pretty crazy, huh? That's a pretty cool, that's a decent flip from Amiga. You, could, you know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, you, I could see that. The same kind of music would, I'm about to say it, obviously the exact same kind of wouldn't, but I mean, mm -hmm. the kind of games that you would find on the Game, on the game Boy series, they would work well with his stuff. He's, yeah. Because I mean, when you've got the musical talent, it, tra it travels. Right, right. And so uh, if you're interested in checking out uh, and a nice interview, then check out this link over at the subreddit, uh, the Amiga News subreddit. Very good, but good. That was a good find right there, Thank man. Thank you. Uh, next up, Aaron, you're going to talk about this one. One of your favorite games is coming as an Amiga port. I was super excited about this, uh, and I got less excited when I read about the system specs. But anyway, uh, uh, Bazilli is porting over an old DOS game I used to play back in the day called Death Rally. Mm. You know me. 
If it's got death in there, you know it's gold. <laughs> and he, this one's just, it's still in the, in the works, but it looks like it's going to be a winner. You ever, did you ever play or hear about Death Rally back no, in the day? No, I know so little about DOS gaming. I mean, you it's could, funny how, you know, I, we talk to people, we know people well. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll just cite Dave Velociraptor, who thinks that this era of gaming, the DOS era, is the finest gaming ever on any machine. Now, I disagree with Dave Velociraptor <laughs> on that, but there were a few gems that staggered stupidly through the DOS era. Death Rally was one of them. It's just, it it's, looks very nice. It's exactly what you think it is. It's sort of anime. It's a top, it's overhead racing with, and this makes sense with the weapons and stuff. This was, uh, you got to remember that the DOS uh, games were always lagging behind for you. And so when they finally started to catch up, you did get some exciting titles. And I thought this was cool just because I liked the way it looked. Yeah. It played well. There were a lot of fun additional stuff. Uh, one of the things about it that was a lot of fun, we had really awesome tunes. Uh, so that's cool. Now, so here are the requirements to play this game when it comes over the Amiga. Right now, you have to have a 68040 or 60, and you need that FPU. Apparently, there's a lot of uh, calculations going mm-hmm. on. You also need Kickstart 3, AGA, at 8 megs of memory, 45 meg hard drive space. Now, here's the bummer on this, and this is a bummer, and I hope they'll address this. No multiplayer. Uh, you have to use the fixed game pad, which that could have been baked into the game for all we know. But the big bummer, no music. Yeah, that's that's a hard thing to overcome. That's a real bummer. So I don't know uh, exactly when this is going to be ready to go, uh, but uh, I believe it's pretty close. It's funny. I, they've got it here that the original game ran on a 486 with 8 megs of RAM up to a Pentium 90 with 16 megs of RAM. So in that sweet spot right there. Mm. That's... That's some decent power, you know, of that. That's, right. that's not bad. So right. you can see why it's going to take a little more oomph uh, yeah. than, than uh, most people you know, can muster. If you're interested in checking this out and you don't want to wait for the Amiga version, the original DOS version is available now on Steam for free. Yeah, for oh, free. really? Good, yeah. Boat. Excellent work, yeah. Boat. I did not know that. It looks like it's running like a maniac yeah. here, too. Good stuff there, Boatster. Uh, Boat, the last thing on our agenda here is not actually news. It's actually, we're going to open some stuff up. This is some fun stuff we've had for the last couple of weeks. We missed it last week. And Boat knows more about one of these than I do, and I know more about one than the other. So, Boat, we'll get to start with this. Okay. So, this is something that comes from the UK. And this is the man with the golden joystick. The man with the golden stick. Remember that song? Is that the James Bond song? Yeah, for the man with the golden gun. Oh. Yeah, you can get away with that. Um, I, I, maybe not. I don't know. So yeah, this is uh, this is the from the Sloney Soft. So this is one of our new patrons on the show, Aaron. Uh, I think his name is Davy Sloan. Yeah, I've seen and, him. Uh, and he is a uh, what he does is him and his kid program ZX Spectrum titles. And uh, this is this is one of them. So we're gonna have to check this out. You know, uh, I have a plus two. Uh, uh, that is uh, functional, and we're gonna have to load. We're gonna have to have another one of those days, Aaron, where we we load up the spectrum. We we bring some. T- we well, got a whole wall of tapes there to yeah. go through, and tons more coming. Yeah, yeah. So thank was, you. you know, when we did that, that was so much fun. Yeah, I just love that so much. We don't do that enough. Mm-hmm. We should definitely. That should be the next one we do. Look at that. I love yeah. the album cover. The, yeah. I mean the uh, tape cover. It's yeah, very it's very cool. And this Dave Dave and Nate Sloan developed by these guys. And uh, they're using an engine called MPAGD, Jonathan Caldwell. So we we'll definitely back, check this out. When we get back from Coco Fest, we're going to put that. That's where I'm hot shot that. Yeah. That sounds great. So the other thing we've got here, and I know what this is. Uh, uh, I got contacted with a fellow. Uh, his name is uh, Pat Nevian. And Pat is a guy who works with, uh, works does musical work with uh, Chris... Hughes back. back, and so they for they sent us to review uh, a new a neat thing. This is Chris Hughes back, the piano collection. Right there it is. Uh, we're gonna have a look at this. Look at that boat. There's uh, 18 tracks. There's 17 tracks, including the theme from Jim Power. Listen to this, Apidia, the Guyana Sisters, uh, Jim Power, like you mentioned, uh, the Turricans, couple Turricans on there. 
uh, uh, more Turricans, the adventure of Quick and Silva, and then Exile as a bonus. You know theme. what we should do, Aaron? If we can manage some way to finagle this, we should play those songs while we're playing the games well, on screen. Or we could li- even listen to them in your car because they also sent us this USB Ooh. drive that came along with it. That's and look at this thing. I got to pull it out of here because look how fancy. It's even got in bo- It's it's got the logo on there as well. Wow, that. that is that yeah. is something. So. Uh, we will be giving this a listen That's to. It's real. It's not gold. <laughs> what do you? I just turn, I turn away for one second, boat, and you're biting it. Look how nice that is, everybody. It's even got the little. It's got the little collection on there. It's so nice. So listen, we appreciate you guys sending that uh, for a review. Uh, and uh, hey, we're we get review stuff again. Remember, we used to, there was a time where we got review stuff, mm-hmm. and then we sort of didn't get it. So. We're back in the game. We're back in it. Uh, So we'll be giving, and we both love the Hules, so we'll be giving that stuff a go. Um, While we're here, Boat, uh, we should probably mention a few things. You know, Boat just printed up so many nice things, but one of the things he printed up here, I'm going to hold it up here. I I feel like I'm the Brent. That's what Brent does. Are you going to mount it on your gut? No. Look right here, everybody. Bam. Tell them about it, Boat. Boat Fest 2023 is less than two months away. No. Actually, it's more than two months away. <laughs> I'm just saying, don't do that to me. It's, it's two, two months and two days away. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you have not yet uh, gotten your tickets, uh, head on over to BoatFest.info. It is West Virginia's premier retro computing event. We are bringing in guests from all over the world, including Australia, the UK, Canada, Plus, uh, lots of lots of fine folks from all over here in the United States. We are going to have live podcast recordings. Uh, Rob Flack O'Hara is going to be around to tape an episode of Spray Castle. Hopefully, we'll be bringing the van, That's Big Rob's van. Absolutely. Will be in, will be at the house. Um, I, Frank and his crew from Retro Rewind will be on site doing your repairs. Uh, Frank is always uh, good for uh, uh, sitting around and listening to him tell stories of his time in the industry. He's got a million of them. We're going to have an auction. The Brent, master auctioneer, the Brent, is going to auction off all of your fine goods for, yeah. a, for a small fee. Um, and, Watch your uh, wallet. We yeah. run around. <laughs> and uh, we're just going to have a good, a good old time. It's going to be in the Copper Room on Main Street of Hurricane, which is the room above Connolly's Irish Pub. The pub is closed, but the room is still open, and we are going to be there uh, large and in charge. Like I said, June 23rd through 25th. Get your tickets and find out more information at BoatFest.info. Listen, there's going to be, you're not, I mean, listen, you talk about what's these premier computer thing. This is going to, number one, it's one of the only ones. But number two, I guarantee you the assemblage of strange devices is here is going to rival a lot of other bigger con. We're going to have some weird crap at this thing. I'm bringing some weird crap. Others are uh, bringing some weird crap. There's going to be a lot of unusual items at this thing. It's going to be a blast. You know, Oram just said it's closed for Opals. Luca, we take up both floors. That That's a distinct possibility. That's right. We'll just sleep downstairs. Sleep it off downstairs. Yeah. That's going to be a lot of fun. Please, I'm, I beseech you, come see me and Boat. Hey, if you all like us, come smack us around. We're okay with it. Yeah. All right, Aaron. It's time to talk about what we're going to play next week. Oh, man, who knows? Oh, look at this. We put around the block with this one a few times. Mm-hmm. It's the old Moonstone. That's book. right. We are going to take a second look. We did Moonstone way, way back in 2015 or 2016. It's time for a second look. I'm looking forward to diving back into this. When we played some of this on Amigathon last year and had a good time. Let me tell you something. The last time I played this, I was doing it old You school. did a great job. I was you were, yeah. suckers. You, did a, you had a good run. The first time we did this, this is one of those shows... Sometimes people, the rewatch has people like, oh, they're going back. Listen, we weren't ready. No. We weren't ready for Moonstone. You can't be that prepared that early in the run. Mm-hmm. It takes years of skilled practice. Now I'm ready to take on the Moonstone. And we're going to give this thing a fair and honest review. We're going to call it right down the middle. But I'm looking forward to it. And I may have to whoop on you a little bit at some point to get my uh, Moonstone on, because that's great with multiplayer. It is, it is. And of course, we want to thank all of you for listening and watching. If you like our show and you want to support us, you can head over to patreon.com slash Amigos Podcast. We will record the show live every Friday night on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Amigos Retro Gaming. Uh, we, su- we appreciate all of our Twitch subs, all of our Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much for listening and or watching. We will see you next week, and until then, adios. adios.